has ever happened in Las Vegas. A young woman murdered. She didn't deserve to die the way that she died. Her rich boyfriend, heir to a great American fortune. If you have enough money, and you have enough lawyers, you can get away with quite a bit. The serpent who would do anything for his mistress. People go to amazing lengths for rich people. And in the shadows, the beautiful socialite who controlled everything. Or did she? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. The Del Mar Resort Motel on the Las Vegas Strip. Rooms here rent by the hour and the porn is free. On August 5th, 1998, a maintenance worker found the body of a woman inside an air conditioning duct in room six. She had been strangled and tied up. There was no identification on her. Four days later, a man named Dean McWiggan went to the police and reported his girlfriend, Patty, missing. She was last seen, he said, on her way to the Del Mar. Dean told the police that Patty had a history of drugs and prostitution. For the detectives, it sounded like a routine case. A junkie dead in a seedy motel. Until Dean McWiggan told them who he was. An heir to the DuPont fortune. It was hard to believe. A DuPont involved in a sleazy Las Vegas murder. But as the investigation played out, the police would discover a trail that led back to one of America's richest and most secretive families. Dean said he wasn't involved, but he knew who was. He said his stepfather, Christopher Mosley, had wanted to get rid of Patty. So did his mother, Lisa, a reclusive heiress with a scandalous past. Lisa Dean was born into a world of fabled wealth and privilege, the world of the DuPonts. The DuPonts had been in Delaware since the early 1800s, there, they had built their fortune and their mansions and became a kind of American royalty. In time, this part of Delaware came to be known as Chateau Country. The DuPonts had the big houses. Um, they owned the newspaper. They controlled the financial world. Um, they controlled the political world. So it was their little fiefdom. The family patriarch left behind him not just wealth, but a unique approach to managing his fortune. The DuPonts started out in 1802 with the founder of the family saying that he really deliberately wanted to pursue inbreeding. He wanted cousin marriages because that would lead to honesty of soul and purity of blood. And so you, you socialized with one another, you married one another, and that was your world. Name and ancestry meant everything in Lisa's world. She would have been expected to marry somebody of her own class. She would have gone to the same parties as other rich people, hired the same interior designers, gone to the same schools where, where other people like her would have gone. After college, Lisa moved to New York. Her name and her looks quickly made her a celebrated society beauty. I used to see Lisa Dean at parties in the 1950s. You couldn't take your eyes off her. She was so beautiful. She looked rich even before you knew she was. Whenever her name came up, people would whisper, she's a DuPont, you know. 
Lise was very good looking. She was tall and had a wonderful black helmet of hair, very lacquered and bright looking, and marvelous clothes. And she had a lot of flair. You would cast Lauren Bacall as her, or some, you know, Betty Davis in her prime to play her. In 1952, Lisa met Red Shandor, a dashing society figure. The two were immediately attracted to each other. Red was a man about town and uh, absolutely catnip to ladies. And we'd see him at nightclubs. He got around a lot. And especially, I think he got around a lot with Lisa. The two of them were very, very popular. Within a year, Lisa and Shandor married and began the serious work of a society couple, enjoying themselves. Most of the dinners were given at home, and it wouldn't matter how long it lasted. If it lasted until one o'clock, it was a huge success of a party. When you left at one o'clock, someone would surely say, let's go and have a drink at Morocco. And one would do that, and you'd stay until three or four. In 1954, Lisa and Red had a child, Peter. With the birth of her son, Lisa got a nickname, Mummy. Life for the Shandors was a round of parties, vacations, and summer houses. Weekends were very long. You know, you'd leave Thursday and come back on Tuesday. So there wasn't a lot of uh, time to go to offices. All the men had an office, but they used it to get their mail and get telephone messages and things. <laughs> Three years later, Lisa's second son, Dean, was born. But the birth of Dean brought the end of Lisa's marriage and a scandal that shocked New York society. She left her husband, Red Shandor, for her obstetrician, Dr. John McWigan. Shandor was furious. Impulsively, he took his older son, Peter, and left the country. The scandal was splashed across newspapers. A few months later, the police caught up with Shandar on the French Riviera, and Peter was returned unharmed. Shandar paid his debt to society with four months in jail and a $47,000 fine. But what the authorities could do to Shandor was nothing compared to what Lisa could do to him. She changed the boy's last names to McWigan and banned Shandor from ever seeing his sons. With her boys in tow, Lisa and her new husband moved to her estate in Delaware, Serendip. At Serendip, Lisa was in charge. She's just very commanding presence, someone used to being an authority, somebody used to being the center of attention, somebody used to uh, giving out orders. The boys grew up in old money splendor, but by the early 70s, 15-year-old Dean, who had been sent to an elite prep school, had started smoking pot and dropping acid. In college, he moved on to cocaine. Family members said that by the time he graduated in 1979, Dean had been arrested for dealing drugs, and Lisa had pulled strings, saving him from jail time. It's pretty common for the children of the wealthy to be screw-ups. Everything that they need is always taken care of. I mean, if they drop the clothes on the floor, there's somebody there to pick them up. Um, they, they never suffer any consequences when they're growing up. They never have to earn anything, and that just gets built into their psychology. Dean's brother, Peter, was also in trouble, living on his trust fund and doing heroin. On one hand, she expected the boys to maintain a facade for everybody in Chateau country. But on the other hand, she basically would let them be as wild as they ever wanted to be. 
In 1984, Dean's father used his connections to get Dean a job on Wall Street. But it didn't last long. Red Sandor and I have known each other for a long time. Even back then, he was worried about his sons and he thought Dean was headed for serious trouble. Until now, Dean had been able to rely on his mother to get him out of trouble. But soon, Dean would be so far in over his head that even Mommy, with all of her money, wouldn't be able to make it better. When the body of a murdered woman was discovered in a Las Vegas motel, detectives uncovered a trail leading back to DuPont heiress Lisa Dean Mosley. Lisa's family had been troubled for years. Her sons Peter and Dean were involved with drugs and living on trust funds. And a dangerous new man was about to enter the family. In 1985, Lisa's husband of 30 years, Dr. John McWigan, died suddenly of a heart attack. Lisa went into mourning, but she wouldn't go to the funeral. You know, I think there's a tendency among women of this class to distance themselves from emotional trauma of any kind, and, and you know, what more so than a funeral. Uh, so. Um, yeah, she, she, would, she would not want to appear someplace where she wasn't in control um, and where she was at a, at a loss. Alone on her sprawling estate, Lisa realized she needed help. Mommy put an ad in the newspaper, uh, one of the Wilmington newspapers advertising for a gardener. And Christopher Mosley showed up in a uh, Volkswagen painted in camouflage colors. Christopher Mosley was not your ordinary gardener. He had been born into a social register family from Long Island, gone to prep school, but got kicked out and joined the army. He was full of stories about assassination plots and undercover operations, but no one believed anything Mosley said. Christopher Mosley was a Walter Mitty type of person. He would portray that he was this big military man, that he had escaped from a military um, concentration camp using only a spoon, you know, just nonsense stuff. Mosley had spent 25 years in the Army including tours of Korea and Vietnam without ever rising above the rank of sergeant. But he had a dangerous need to feel important. At Serendip, Mosley was becoming more than Lisa's gardener. He devoted himself to her completely, and Lisa liked it that way. What is important is uh, attention, you know, worship. Um, somebody who's willing to be flattering all the time, somebody who's willing to pay court and be in attendance all the time. Soon, Christopher Mosley proposed marriage to Lisa. One day while they were planting a tree at Serendip, he tells her he's going to have to quit his job because he was falling in love with her. And so Chris took her in his arms and he gave her this big kiss and told her he loved her and the two of them fell in love. and. Chris moved from the gardener's uh, hut into the uh, main bedroom. They were married later that year. Mosley had no money of his own. Lisa supported him. It would prove to be a fatal dependence. Christopher Mosley wasn't, he wasn't born rich. He wasn't a DuPont. Uh, so he was on a short leash. He didn't have access to all that money that Lisa had access to. He was definitely more of an employee than a husband, a servant with bedroom privileges. Dean hated Mosley. He called him Mummy's pet rat. 
He was always going off on these missions on behalf of Mummy. Most of the missions involved the boys, Peter and Dean and screw-ups that they were involved in and, and Christopher trying to act as Mummy's agent and bail them out or get them out of trouble. Dean had developed a dangerous taste for street life, hanging out with junkies and prostitutes in a run-down section of Philadelphia. If Lisa disapproved, Dean didn't seem to care, and he was about to bring someone into the DuPont world who would threaten everything the family valued. In 1991, Dean met Linda Plessia, nicknamed Rags, a bookkeeper living in L.A. The two started dating, and a year later, they married. Rags was not what Lisa wanted in a daughter-in-law. Mommy wanted another blue blood aristocrat for a daughter-in-law. And Linda's problem was that she was this middle-class kid from uh, Colorado. So she wasn't going to cut the mustard, and she also wasn't very deferential to Mommy. So that was two problems. I got to know Rags while I was reporting this story. It was hard not to feel sorry for her. She was in love when she married Dean and thought the future looked bright. Middle class girl marries into one of America's richest families. Rags didn't know what she was getting herself into. There's a tendency, a built-in tendency in this family to look at any outsider as an interloper, a threat, somebody who's going to take away a chunk of the fortune. But much of Dean's fortune was going toward drugs. He and Rags were living in Louviers, one of the DuPont mansions near Lisa's estate. Lisa was paying their rent. Dean was spending most of his trust fund income on his habit. He would get so uh, high on drugs, he would come, he would break into Louvier in the middle of the night and he'd crack windows and he'd come in like a raging madman, screaming at, uh, obscenely at his wife. Three years after Dean and Rags got married, Dean's brother Peter died of an overdose. Dean's behavior got even worse. Rags wanted him to go to rehab, but Lisa didn't see it that way. Mummy just told her flat out, you know, drug hit rehab is just a waste of time. And uh, when Rags pushed her on it, she just basically said, you know, let him do whatever he wants. And she just took a drag on her cigarette and dismissed the topic. Finally, in 1996, Dean left Louviers to enter a rehab program. Within weeks, Lisa kicked her daughter-in-law out of the house. Mommy just showed up one day at, at uh, Louvier, and she had a clipboard under her arm and uh, Christopher in tow, and she just walked through the place like she was, you know, a real estate agent. And she just started uh, tagging uh, valuables that belonged to her. Uh, heirlooms that she had given her son, portraits of her great-grandfather, and, and this type of thing. Rags told me that Lisa looked right at her and said, I want you out of here as soon as possible. She told her, don't even try to call us. She fired her daughter-in-law the way you fire a maid. When Dean returned from rehab six months later, he had a new girlfriend, Patty Margello. For the class-conscious Lisa, Patty was a nightmare. She was this little anorexic junkie waif with no teeth, was the way she was described to me. And uh, if mommy didn't like Linda, I'm sure she was horrified by Patty. Lisa had already gotten rid of her son's wife. Now she was determined to get rid of his girlfriend. 
her wish would take an unpredictable and deadly turn. In 1996, Dean McWiggan went into rehab to deal with a cocaine habit that was out of control. While he was gone, his mother Lisa kicked out his wife. When Dean returned six months later, he had his new girlfriend with him, Patty Margello. She was everything Lisa hated. And Patty didn't know how dangerous that would be. Patty had grown up in South Philadelphia in a working class Italian neighborhood. By her early 20s, she was a popular member of the local club scene. Patty was vibrant, she was full of life and um, good heart, good soul. If anyone asked her to help them with anything, you know, Patty was there. She was also very, very attractive. She was a very, very attractive woman. Patty had started out using cocaine for fun, but she soon became addicted to crack and crystal meth. To support her habit, she sometimes turned tricks. She just was always, you know, as they used to say, you know, speeding her ass off. Lou Veers, the beautiful 150-year-old DuPont mansion, became a drug den for Patty and Dean. They were getting high all the time and trashing the house. It was more than Lisa could stand. She threw Dean and Patty out of Louvier's. They moved to a row house in South Philly. They were always high on drugs and low on cash. I've been to Louvier's. And I've been to that South Philadelphia row house. The contrast is astonishing. Lou Veers was a gem. The place in Philadelphia was one step up from a flop house. Dean had gone slumming with a vengeance, and Lisa was horrified. There's a very strong relationship between mothers and sons in the families of the wealthy. The mother's gonna be very concerned about who he marries. But then he goes off and his girlfriend is, is a crack addict and she uh, is an occasional prostitute and this clearly is not gonna advance the family fortunes. Lisa was desperate to separate them. Dean's trust fund was cut off, leaving him with no income. But he wouldn't give Patty up. He said that she was uh, his demon and is just reflection of his deepest, darkest self. I guess he had one wife in Chateau country and he had another life in Row House country. And um, they were sort of a perfect match because Patty was just as wild and crazy as he was. Lisa sent her servants to South Philadelphia with notes for Dean, begging him to leave Patty. Because all of these cars drove up from Wilmington with these uh, flashy license plates on it, looking for this hobo named Dean. And the neighbors were wondering, why did all these aristocrats care about this hobo? What they didn't know was that the man who seemed just like another down-on-his-luck junkie was a multi-millionaire. They thought he was a street bum, and they were stunned to discover that he was just some sort of aristocrat worth 25 million. While Dean and Patty were in South Philly, Dean's wife Rags sued for spousal support and won a judgment of $4,000 a month. In the summer of 1998, Mosley came up with a plan to get both Rags and Patty out of Dean's life. Dean was sent to Las Vegas without Patty, so he could establish residency and get a quick divorce from Rags. To make sure things went smoothly, Christopher Mosley went to Las Vegas to keep an eye on Dean. 
He was given so much money to take care of this Dean situation, to get Dean's divorce, to come out here to establish residency so that Dean could get divorced here in Las Vegas. Mosley took the job seriously. So seriously that in the end it led to disaster. Always given to fantasies of himself as a military mastermind, he named the task Operation Dean. Operation Dean had four steps. The first, set up headquarters in the Las Vegas Hilton. The second, establish Nevada residency for Dean. The third, hire a lawyer. The fourth, file for divorce. But by the end of the first week, Dean had done nothing but burn through thousands of dollars on drugs and gambling. By the second week, Patty had flown out to Vegas and the couple were in the hotel doing coke and crystal meth. Mosley was furious. Well, whenever he came out here, he was to come out alone. That Patty wasn't supposed to come out here. When he started gambling, he started using the drugs. He brought and spent money to bring Patty out here. That's when everything went astray. Mosley began drinking heavily, as much as a bottle of vodka a day. Things were deteriorating. Mosley couldn't control Dean or Patty. The whole time he was here, I think he was drunk. And uh, the one time I met him, uh, he was in a room at the Hilton, laying in bed naked, drunk. Mosley offered Patty money if she left, but Patty didn't intend to go anywhere. Patty didn't put up with crap from anybody, so she just told him off. And the two of them got into it. And at one point, according to the statements Dean gave the police, uh, basically, Christopher had threatened her, saying, you know, look, if you continue to screw around with the family, I'm going to take you out. Patty didn't take Mosley seriously. Nobody ever did. But Mosley was about to meet somebody who would. Diana Hiranaga, a porn star hooker who cruised the slot machines for customers. Hiranaga, who had acted in porn under the name Keani Lee, met Mosley one night in a casino. He regaled her for hours with stories of his exploits and undercover missions. Diana Hiranaga was buying into all of it, that he went on secret missions, that he worked with the CIA. And if she proved herself to him on this mission, then he would continue to use her and continue to, that this cash cow would continue rolling. Mosley hired Hiranaga, giving her $5,000 out of his Operation Dean budget. Mosley's idea was that Hiranaga would become Patty's friend and talk her into leaving Dean. But Hiranaga wasn't getting anywhere with Patty either. Mosley was angry and frustrated. Operation Dean was failing. What he would ask Hironaga to do next would be deadly. Christopher Mosley was in Las Vegas on a mission. He had to separate his stepson, Dean, from his lower-class girlfriend, Patty. But Mosley hadn't been able to do it. Nor had his assistant, Diana Hiranaga. Patty just wouldn't go away. You know, you marry somebody who has less money than you do. So they have to kind of overachieve, in a way, to be worthy of that and to flatter, to be obedient, to go out and do things, to anticipate what someone might want and do that, that thing before... It's even asked for. What Mosley decided to do was to get rid of Patty permanently. Together, he and Diana Hironaga came up with a plan. It would be the fifth step of Operation Dean. Mosley hired two men Diana knew, 
Then he left town, leaving her to complete the mission. On the night of August 1st, 1998, Hironaga called Patty. She said two high rollers she knew wanted to go out with some women for a night on the town. There would be plenty of money in it for Patty and Dean. Dean had said that Diana Hironaga had approached Patty with a, an opportunity to go out on the town with a couple high rollers to make some quick money. Shortly after midnight, Diana and Patty met up with the two high rollers. The men were actually Diana's boyfriend, Ricardo Murillo, a convicted drug dealer, and Joseph Balignasa, an unemployed dishwasher. The four drove to the Del Mar Resort Motel. I've been to the Del Mar Motel as a reporter, not as a client. When I went there, the manager recognized me from the O.J. Simpson trial and let me look around. It's a very seedy place. You can tell it's seen a lot of sleazy things. Diana checked in using her real name and paid the clerk $30 for three hours in room number six. She had told Patty that they would stay just briefly at the motel before going out on the town. But after several hours, they were still in room six, and the high rollers seemed more like the petty criminals they were. It all began to feel very wrong to Patty. At about 2.30 a.m., she telephoned Dean at his hotel. She was uh, uncomfortable with the situation that she was in. She pled with him to come get her from the uh, hotel. But Dean said he had just been in a fight and his nose had been broken. He would later tell the police that he didn't know where the Del Mar was or how to get there. Dean claimed he didn't have any money, he couldn't help her. He just basically, you know, dropped the ball, left her hanging. Patty, the police later thought, must have realized that she was on her own. No one was going to help her. She went into the bathroom, perhaps hoping she could climb out a window. But the bathroom in room number six has no windows. They were all in the room. Uh, they were smoking a little uh, methamphetamine and uh, probably clouded their senses. And uh, they just wanted it done. And all, all they could see were the dollar signs. According to Joseph Balignasa, it was Diana who made the next move. While Patty was in the bathroom, Diana turned to the two men and said, so are you guys going to do this or not? When Patty came back into the room, the men got up from their seats. They were getting ready to get up and to leave that, that hotel. Um, and as they were walking out, Ricardo grabbed Patty and started to strangle her. When he was unable to physically strangle her with his hands, he asked for Joseph Balignas's belt to help him. That was not the initial plan, that they weren't going to murder her at the Del Mar Hotel. That's why they allowed her to make the phone call, because again, she wasn't going to be killed there. Diana and the men had planned to kill Patty in the desert. Now, they had a body on their hands and they were afraid they would be seen if they tried to move her. They decided to put the body in a garbage bag and hide it at the Del Mar. The two men went to a drugstore to buy bags. In nearly every case I've covered, the bad guys make a crucial blunder. And this one was no exception. There were 30 surveillance cameras in that drugstore that filmed these guys while they were deciding which garbage bags to buy to put the body in. They're bumbling idiots, even Christopher Mosley. Now, this is their first uh, attempt at uh, homicide uh, killing for money. And it just didn't go right. 
Hiranaga and the men put Patty's body in the bags and stuffed her into an air conditioning vent. Then they left the Del Mar. At 6.30 a.m. Las Vegas time, Hironaga called Delaware. She left a message on Mosley's answering machine saying that Patty Margello would no longer be a problem. The next day, Mosley sent Diana Hironaga and Ricardo Murillo two first-class airplane tickets. Hironaga and Murillo flew east. Mosley's chauffeur met them at the Philadelphia airport with a package containing $15,000. They returned to Vegas on the next plane. On August 5th, Patty's body was discovered. A customer was in the room and complained to the management about a foul odor coming from the air conditioner. Uh, the maintenance people came in and took the door off and saw this large trash bag. And when they tried to pull it out, the side of the bag ripped and it exposed part of a human leg. And I think they went out of the room screaming. It's covered with garbage bags and stuffed into an air conditioning duct at the motel. Four days later, after hearing about the discovery of the body on the local news, Dean McQuiggan went to the police and became their prime suspect. I was very suspicious of Dean, so I wanted to talk to him myself. So I had Dean come in uh, with Detective Misner. We again interviewed Dean and went through his story. Dean said that Patty had gone out with Diana Hironaga and the two men, and that Patty had called him from the Del Mar because she felt frightened. He hadn't gone to her because he had been in a fight and broken his nose. At that time, we had phone records uh, to back up some of his story. Um, and through the, the interrogation, and that's what it was at the time. It was an interrogation because he was a suspect at that time. Um, his story was believable. Dean told the police he knew who was behind the murder. His stepfather, Christopher Mosley, and Mosley's assistant, Diana Hironaga. The police questioned Hironaga first. She admits leaving the Hilton, but she claims that she'd left Patricia Margello earlier in the evening and doesn't know where, where she was. But the detectives had Hironaga's signature on the Del Mar register. They told her that if she didn't come clean, they would charge her with murder. At that time, Diana started to panic. She wanted to tell us everything at that point. She wanted to tell us about Christopher Mosley, about the whole plan, how this is all a five-stage mission, and she had proof of this, and she started rummaging through her hotel room, which at the time we didn't have a search warrant for, but she was handing us all this stuff. She kept tons of notes, detailed notes about how every step of this plan, and then there were facts that sent back and forth between her and Mosley, and basically all the details were there for the police to stumble on. Hironaga gave the police a full confession, including the names of the actual killers, Ricardo Murillo and Joseph Balignasa. But the paper trail Mosley had left behind wasn't enough to convict him. Dean had always hated his stepfather, the man he called Mummy's Pet Rat. He agreed to help the police by wearing a wire and trying to get Mosley to incriminate himself. During that conversation, Christopher Mosley implicated himself in this homicide. Uh, however, it wasn't enough at that time for prosecution. We took our shot. Uh, we really didn't get anything. So that's when we said we had nothing to lose. Just go talk to him and confront him. 
Mosley was no longer in Las Vegas. He was back in Delaware. The detectives headed east. It was time to question Mosley and get behind the closed doors of the DuPont mansion to confront the reclusive heiress, Lisa Dean. The deadly chain of events that had led to the death of Patty Margiela was about to be revealed. Diana Hironaga and Dean McWigan had told police that the man behind the murder was Christopher Mosley. But Mosley was back at Serendip in Delaware. When the police arrived, he was preparing for the gala opening of the Fieldstone Golf Club. The club was a gift to Mosley from his wife, DuPont heiress Lisa Dean. Finally, Mosley would have something of his own. Mosley certainly wasn't the gardener anymore. This was going to be his big night. It was going to be a lavish party. There was a huge tent. Waiters were setting up tables, carrying out champagne glasses. What Mosley didn't know was that two Las Vegas detectives were on their way to crash his party. He was well-dressed. He invited us in. I could detect he'd been drinking a little bit uh, on his breath. But uh, other than that, he was uh, ready to play the game with us. They ask him if he wants a lawyer present. He says, no, 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 I don't need a lawyer. Uh, go ahead and ask your questions. And that was mistake number one. He had the, the demeanor of uh... You know, you can't handle the truth type demeanor, the, the again, the military aspect of, of this thing and uh, was going to bluff his way right through the whole interview. But as soon as Lisa's name was mentioned, Mosley's attitude changed. And they said to him, you know, was she in on it? And that's when they even noted for the record, I, I, I see your hands are shaking, you know, take it easy or whatever. And that's when he says, um, no, he, and there's a lot of stammering on the tape and he flat out says, I did it. And then they said to him, did she give you the money for this? And he said, uh, no, she had no idea what I was doing. The detectives continued to press mostly, but he insisted that he acted alone. Messinar and Shields found that hard to believe. Christopher Mosley did not have the authority or the money to do this without someone backing him. Everything he got, he got from his wife and, and her, her funds. And it uh, doesn't take a market scientist to figure it out. The detectives hadn't expected Mosley to sacrifice himself for Lisa so quickly. His confession surprised them. After we were done, and I told him to stand up that he was under arrest, Detective Mesner was like, what? Because you know, we weren't expecting to, to arrest him there. He had the world by uh, the tail. He didn't have to talk to us. So we had him back at the FBI office in Wilmington. He, we would let him write a little letter to uh, Lisa Dean where he asked her to cooperate with us. And we delivered that when we went and talked to her. From the FBI office, Mosley called his wife to tell her he'd been arrested for the murder of Patty Margello. He talked to her first and uh, she put me on the phone, or he put me on the phone with Lisa, his wife, and uh, I told her that we were going to come talk to her, and uh, in somewhat a uh, nonchalant voice, she says, oh, I can hardly wait. An hour later, the detectives arrived at Serendip. We were kind of intrigued. I mean, we're small-town guys, really, coming into... Uh, you know, uh, a mansion that has you driving for two days just to get back to this house, it seemed like. Big, 
huge estate. Never seen a house that big. Once we got in there, uh, it was a smoke-filled, hazy room. And Lisa, she was just a chain smoker. Uh, and kind of flirtatious, actually. Lisa told the detective she had known nothing of the plan to kill Patty. She uh, didn't give us the impression that she cared. Uh, I gave her the letter that her husband wrote to her, and uh, she read it. And I saw no emotion. And all she did was sit and listen to us and uh, deny uh, knowing anything of the, uh, of the homicide. You expect people caught up in a murder investigation to be a little nervous. Detective Messinar told me that Lisa was very calm. Too calm. Apparently, she wasn't worried that they were going to come after her. After all, she was a DuPont. She was actually uh, relieved that Christopher had done what he had done. Uh, she was backing him, and she backed him clear up through the trial prep and everything else. She was trying to bail him out. He was not the bad guy in this in her eyes. The bad guy was Dean. Deep down in my heart, I don't know about the other investigators involved in this, but deep down in my heart, she knew what was going on, and she put her rubber stamp on everything that was going on. The police left Delaware with nothing they could use against Lisa. If she had ordered the murder, they couldn't prove it. And without proof, no one was about to take on the DuPont heiress. Christopher Mosley the husband of DuPont heiress Lisa Dean Mosley had been arrested and charged with the murder of Patty Margello. He said he had acted alone, but detectives suspected that Mosley was under orders from his rich wife. I think he took the fall for Lisa. I, I really do. Uh, he did it uh, to protect her. Uh, he... Uh, knew that she was going to back him, uh, provide him attorneys, and she would most likely be there for him uh, when he gets, if he gets out of prison. There was nothing the detectives could do. They had uncovered a clear motive for Patty's death, and it pointed straight at Lisa. But Lisa denied having any role, and there was absolutely no evidence tying her to the crime. She has unlimited resources. And uh, the fact that uh, she was married to the middleman um, was able to, that was able to uh, keep her insulated from the prosecution. In March of 2000, Ricardo Murillo was convicted of murder and was given two life sentences. Balignasa was given 10 to 25 years. Diana Hironaga, who had testified against Murillo, pled guilty in exchange for a lighter sentence, 15 years. Mosley also testified against Murillo. He pled guilty and avoided a public trial. Despite the high society names involved, there was little media coverage. Mosley was sentenced to 14 years. He was sent to a federal prison in Fairton, New Jersey, just a short distance from Lisa's estate. Lisa has stayed in close contact with her husband. I ran into one of Lisa's friends at a party after Mosley was sent away. I asked how he was doing. She said he was pretty happy. You gotta remember, Mosley had been in the army for 25 years, then married to Lisa for nine. This was a guy who didn't mind taking orders. People are willing to do anything for the rich, including in some cases die for them. 
And so for somebody to go to jail for the rich is not really not that big a hit. It's, it's kind of what subordinates do. Mosley has never wavered from his statement that the DuPonts, Dean and Lisa, are completely innocent. There certainly is a, a feeling that if you have enough money and you have enough lawyers and if, if you have enough people writing letters on your behalf, that you, know, you can get away with quite a bit. Definitely, having money helps. There's no question. That's very powerful. It helps to be well-known. It helps to be a celebrity. It helps to be rich. They always get a little more attention, a little softer fall than, than the poor. Although the detectives closed the case, they continued to believe that Mosley was covering up for the DuPonts. People of power think that uh, their money is a doorway to anything they want. And to me, this is a prime example of what they thought their money could buy. I would think in my heart that she's responsible. Yeah, I do. And it, it may not be that she planned this or helped in the planning or did anything, but she condoned this. I'll never know. I mean, uh, did, did she, you know, is that what she wanted him to do? But we, we won't know. But it certainly turned out conveniently for her. And it, it certainly didn't... You know, she never had to pay any price of any kind. Whatever Lisa's role had been, she had gotten what she wanted. Patty was gone. Mosley, the one-time gardener, was in prison. Dean and Lisa, the DuPonts in the case, went on with their lives. No one was ever able to pin anything on them. It's hard to win against power and privilege in Delaware or anywhere else. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.